G'day guys, welcome to another Oak Barrel After Hours. It's the uh, very first ever Oak Barrel After Hours in December, considering oh, this, this is too. the first year that we've done this, um, and it's now officially December, which is equal parts mm. exciting and absolutely bloody scary. It's terrifying. Um, the year has come, 2019 definitely happened. I was here, I saw bits of it, <laughs> but it is gone, it is long going, and all of a sudden, uh, we're gonna get to 2020. Um, in a matter of weeks. My name is Scott Fitzsimons, and sitting to my left is... Uh, Joe Perry. Joe Perry. Um, and we uh, work here at the Oak Barrel Bottle Store, smack bang in the middle of uh, Sydney and Elizabeth Street. Um, basically, if you haven't tuned into one of these tastings before, uh, so one of these tastings, one of these, these live streams before, when the store closes, I look after all the whiskey and spirits here at the Oak Barrel, Joey, all the wines. When the store closes, we sort of sit around and share some drinks and discuss and think about the world of great drinks but also what's coming into the oak barrel what's new what's exciting and so uh, a few months ago we decided that instead of doing this by ourselves we put a little camera up and let everyone into it uh, to have a bit of a chat so tonight we have a couple of things lined up for you we've got some canadian single paddock whiskey single paddock single paddock all off the the one paddock or oh, the eighth <laughs> mate didn't leave it uh, and some some red wine from austria Correct. In, in, yeah. Yeah. in ten uh, words or less, yeah. what, what would you recommend? What would you say that one? Uh, just yeah, a pioneering young Austrian grower producer making delicious wines. Hooray! It's ten. Yeah. yeah, that's ten. Pretty good. Um, so Joe, obviously you're a bit of a soil nerd. We look <laughs> forward to getting into soil chats when we get to the wine. But I'm thinking of actually maybe talking a little bit of soil when we are uh, dealing with the whiskey as as well. Yeah, I think it's um. Obviously, it's it's so always always hotly discussed in in um, the wine industry, but over the past I know what six to twelve months, so I've constantly just found myself scrolling past um, discussions in different spirits forums and and social pages um, that do speak of the tour of um, whiskey, you know, gins as, especially as well. And I know we've seen it when we did the uh, Saint George, their their tour's gin, which yeah, was yeah. so. Um, unique to its location and, and very like it expressed its location really really well which was a really interesting thing to kind of go down that rabbit hole of terroir in spirits because obviously there is the the main process of distillation and what that sort of removes but I think it's important to see what when things are removed what's still there yeah that makes sense but yeah so yeah i think it, i think it's quite an interesting discussion so before we crack into some booze mm -hmm. i'm going to shuffle the papers and just news any new news this week in your world uh so i guess being or heading into into december like scotty said the events do slow down we did we were lucky enough to have um yeah we're lucky enough to have james erskine and, and tom coleman come by on friday night and just deliver like one of the coolest wine tastings we've done in, in ages with just the, the, the back and forth of, um, I guess, two people that actually know what they're talking about, <laughs> talking about wines. This um, but good. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was pretty incredible looking at some of um, James or, or um, Jama's wines going back to 2011, some of the, the, the yeah. very, very first ones. That was good fun. It was an excellent night mm. and uh, two sort of very different ways to um, present their wines and talk about their wines. And I actually peeled off that quite early I went to a couple of bars by myself and uh, you went out with them how, yeah. did, how, did, how did that go or was that a question for about half an hour uh, no it was, it, was, it was fairly civil I think yeah there was obviously a big weekend uh, for those guys and, and myself as well with a lot of events rolling right through till um, the early hours of Monday um, but no we, we had uh, really good feed at Polly yep so if anyone hasn't been to Polly and, and loves there um, share plates and, and good food and really really good wine list we went down there drank a few bottles of some uh, white Jura a few other bits and pieces so that, that was good fun and then uh, back at it here first thing on uh, Monday uh, Saturday morning I should say um, yeah that was, it was good though it was good yeah. and that was obviously coming off the back of Tuesday at Glendronic Wednesday and Thursday at Lafroy yes yeah, big, week, big week last week at Yama Saturday Sunday yeah, so thank you everyone who came down last week. We had a lot of a lot of fun. Um, g'day to Crafty who's joining in. First coming off the rank tonight. Just turned off the sparge hose and I'm all ears now. 
Excellent news. Same. Looks like I'm glad someone's doing some work here. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't even know what a sparge hose does. Yeah, you know, it brings you a thing from one end of the hose to the other end of the hose. Oh, and then right, when you yeah. want it to stop coming out, you turn it off. <laughs> Easy. Done. Uh, but new release from Crafty coming very soon. Uh, but let's let's get into drinking, and mm-hmm. I might go first if that's all right. Yeah, please, please. Talk about some whiskey. Now, the first thing I want to talk about this whiskey, and I hate judging things by their books by their covers and whiskies by their bottles, um, but we've got a lovely, you probably can't see the um, exposure and contrast isn't particularly good, um, but excellent looking label. It's a, a local uh, artist actually designed or drew this, the, the picture that's on the bottle. But it's, I think they call it the Vinatech yeah, glass yeah, toppers. Yeah. And can I just say for the record, I hate these <laughs> toppers. Some people think they look good. I'm sure that's fine. I can't stand them personally. They're quite finicky. And I can't okay, actually yeah. get, there we go. You've got to go up using two thumbs to get them up and then off and yeah I'm just not a huge fan of it yeah. but I got I got this bottle open so that's <laughs> that's a head start um, but we're going to Canada now so which is uh, it's a bit of an interesting little a bit of an overview of Canadian whiskey from at least my point of view before we start and you have the, the history of whiskey and where we we sit with whiskey in 2019 very soon 2020 still scotch whiskey is the is, is the, the big boy you know it's the one that everyone thinks about and as I think I've said on the stream before every week we will get someone uh, coming to the store and saying hey do you have any of that Japanese scotch or that Australian mm. scotch that American scotch because the term scotch has transcended its category yeah and that's for a number of reasons um, we should probably be drinking a lot of Irish or American whiskey the Irish um, were you know quite dominant in the, the 1820s to the 1850s uh, turn of the century and they've got um, few wars with the English, quite an isolationist policy. Um, prohibition wasn't particularly strong for them either. Um, then America obviously had prohibition and a couple of wars in there meant a long, long time of non-production. Um, and during prohibition, coming at the end of it, scotch was really, really popular because scotch whiskey was coming in to America when there was a real glut of locally produced products. The Irish didn't make it through the, the wars either, but the other one that did make it through was Canada, obviously being so close. But Canadian whiskey has never really taken off the way that Scotch or you know even bourbon now has in a big big way. And you think of brands like Canadian Club, for example. That's obviously the big Hiram Walker, famous um, uh, producer in Canadian whiskey history. And then you like you look on the shelves and you see Canadian Club. You see then the eight year old Canadian Club twelve, Canadian Club twenty, and they're like fifty bucks, sixty bucks, ninety bucks. 120 bucks. Yeah. And where else in the world can you buy a, a whiskey, a 20 year old whiskey for 120 bucks? What you don't see is port finishes and sherry mm. finishes and special glass decanters and gold tops and all these sorts of things. And the Canadians have always just done their own thing and just made whiskey their way. Whoever buys it, buys it. And that's the end of it. Whereas pretty much everyone else in the world has thought of new gimmicks yeah. and marketing yeah, yeah. and ways to make flavours and that sort of thing. And so I think Canadian whiskey almost gets overlooked by, you know, connoisseurs or serious whiskey drinkers or even people just walking into a bottle store going, I want to get into whiskey. There's the Scotch section, there's the Australian, there's the Japanese, there's the American. They just, the Canadian section doesn't exist yeah, yeah. a lot of the times. Um, but they do make some excellent whiskies out of Canada. Um, and this is one that I'm quite excited about um, because it plays a lot into what I love about whiskey when you can trace back transparency and all those sorts of things. Um, and this is from the Shelter Point Distillery. Now, uh, Shelter Point is on, it's in the north sort of end of Vancouver Island. Uh, it's, it's, it's on the coast there up, up north. And Shelter Point is the name of a farm. And Patrick Evans was a dairy farmer and bought Shelter Point Farm in about 2005. Uh, and then I think got a little bit bored of that whole process and sought some investment. I believe the investment came from Scotland or definitely the UK mm. somewhere and sort of got excited about distilling. Um, Shelter Point being not a dairy farm, but a, a grain farm essentially. Mm. Got barley and rye and various things on the farm. And so in 2011, had a still set up and started to distill spirit with the idea of whiskey mainly, but also doing a gin and, and vodkas and that sort of thing. Um, I think it was 2016 was their, their first release. Um, and now they're doing all sorts of things. We see very, very small amounts into Australia through um, through Wonderland Drinks, through Scotty down in Melbourne. So, you know, another one of these cases, they don't need to sell anything out of Canada, let alone yeah. America. So we, we fight hard for these bottles. But this is um, the Shelter Point Montfort District Lot 141. And that is a plot of land on Shelter Point Farm 
where this right, barley okay. was grown. Yeah. Um, it's a limited run. This was uh, an August 2017 release. I believe there's newer ones since that. Um, 46%, 750 mils, um, all unmalted barley, triple okay. distilled. So where, when I say that, where, what I mean by that is when you make a single malt, so it's not a single malt. Mm. A single malt milk uh, whiskey uses malted barley. You get the, the barley grains, you know, basically open us the husks, uh, trick it in thinking it's springtime so it sprouts get all that starch and sugar and you know all that beautiful stuff that the yeast is going to eat to create alcohol this is barley straight off the off, off the plant milled down fermented thrown in there so it's it's going to be a bigger huskier spicier mm. type we're talking on paper here right now in terms of specs does uh, that mean that the yeast have to work or you need a stronger yeast strain to then convert those yeah okay. yeah and i'm not sure exactly what yeast strain they're they're using here but definitely, the reason why you look at Irish single pot still mm -hmm. whiskies and mm -hmm. you look at bourbon, they use corn and rye. Why they use 5%, 10% of malted barley is because it's excellent to ferment. Yeah, yeast yeah. loves it. It's very good to, to start off that um, that process. So then we, um, in this case, uh, which is also unique, is triple distilled. Mm -hmm. So you have that big spicy, again, on paper, what we think that's going to be, big and spicy grain, but triple distilled. So you get a clean up sort of run through. Uh, matured in a mixture of American and European French oak, mm -hmm. so different types of things. A uh, bit of virgin in there. Um, good question from Crafty. What's the minimum age uh, for for Canadian whiskey? I don't believe there is one. Um, yeah, right. I'm going to have to double check that actually. But just like America, I think I'm not sure there is one. Maybe someone out there uh, might might know that off the top of the head. But there's no age on this one. I believe it's about three years old. And what I love, very very nerdy. We were talking about back labels yesterday. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to uh, point that out. Grown out to the exact latitude and longitude. I mean, if you went to Shelter Point and say, "Where's Montfort Lot One Four One?" I'm yeah. sure they'd go, "Yeah, just over there. Go for a hike." Yeah, yeah. But if they didn't, if you, you snuck in the middle of the night, it out. you can still find it. <laughs> That's amazing. Off. I love yeah. that. Which I think is really, really cool. So, why open this or had this bottle tonight? Maybe we had it open, mm -hmm. um, and I think. You know, we, we get very excited about distilleries like Daft Mill in Scotland who are doing very similar things, growing their own grain and, and using that grain to make mm -hmm. whiskies out of. Very, very rare process um, anywhere in the world. We see a little bit in Australia with Peter Bignall down at Belgrove, grows a lot of his own barley. Um, but they do an excellent, um, you know, single grain uh, cast strength. They do a single malt as well that's a little bit core line. But for me, this, this release just that point this is where it is yeah we talk about it all the time in wine and i never get to talk about this sort of stuff yeah, so i'm yeah. pretty excited <laughs> to talk about this i think it's pretty special um this bottle's been open for a little while now a couple, couple of months so it's it's not as green as i mm. do remember it but there's still a lot of grain there that's a, like that's the thing that jumps out at me the most is that kind of i guess yeah, a grainy influence it's like a little bit sort of earthy and herbal so it's still really, really pretty. Yeah. And still got that lovely soft, soft, soft honey note driving through it. Pretty is a very good work. There's almost like a lavender edge or something yeah. to it as well. Yeah, it's it's perfumed. Yeah, perfume has yeah, I'd buy that. But buy that for a dollar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one costs a little bit more than a dollar, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Dollar a nap. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think it's yeah. You know, this is a very small run, uh, 1,441 bottles, I think, came out of this run. Um, there is actually, there's next, the release after this is 1,200 bottles, I think. So mm -hmm. they're, they're very, very small runs in, in production, which is obviously a, is going to be an issue when you only using one farm to create your barley yeah, from. Yeah. But um, at the risk of opening a bit of a rabbit hole here, um, you know, there's been certain conversations about spirits in general, about where your spirit comes from and your base ingredients come from. Um, you know, Japanese whiskey obviously is huge and they make a lot of great single malts there. Go and show me a barley field in Japan. Yeah, yeah. They don't exist. They're getting them from the barley from Europe, which which is fine in, in my opinion. A lot of Australian distilleries, um, although a lot of barley is coming from Australia now, a lot of peated barley is coming from Scotland, a lot of barley coming from New Zealand and that sort of thing as well. You go to Scotland, they make a lot of whiskey in Scotland, a lot of single malt whiskey in Scotland, but there's not enough barley in Scotland to supply that. Where does their barley come from? 
a lot of it comes from Benelux and, and that sort of northern European yeah, right, region. Right, so right. Um, it's, a bit of, <laughs> it's a bit, a bit of a rabbit hole to yeah, open. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think it's one that we should. But as long as we're aware of the fact mm. that, you know, barley comes from all over and move, just like juniper berries in gin, mm-hmm. come from Malta and, and those sorts of places. When you get a bottle like this, when you can track it back, for someone who is fascinated about where things come from and where mm-hmm. they're grown in the ground, it is, this is really quite special. Yeah, this is a really tasty whiskey, though. Yeah, it's great. At 46%, yeah. I wouldn't go too much higher either. No, this is like I think just it's really, really, well really expressive. Yeah. And so you said a mixture of virgin American and French. Well, so they disclose um, American oak right. and French oak. Right. What those casks had in them previously is is undisclosed. Okay, okay. I would, I reckon there's a lot of ex-bourbon American oak cask in there. There'd be mm-hmm. splatterings of, um, and you know, this, again, I honestly don't know too much. I've never been to this distillery. Mm-hmm. I don't know too much about their inner workings. Um, I'd say there's a little bit of, I'd be surprised if it was virgin Mm-hmm. French oak, but it might be like, uh, you know, very soft. Seasoned or something like that. Yeah, yeah. sort of, uh, and I'm, you know, 100, you know, 1400 bottles. You're talking about two or three casks, mm-hmm. really, particularly at this age, maybe maybe four. But we don't know if they haven't been skimmed off eight casks. Yeah. And yeah. they're let to go. So, um, not too sure, honestly, on the makeup, but I, a lot of bourbon, and you can sell by like that honey caramel mm-hmm. thing right at the end. Um, and maybe a bit of virgin as well, because. I mean, it's hard to tell when the grain is so cereally and spicy forward. Yeah, yeah. How much of that might be coming from oak tannins? Yeah, it is nice and spicy. But yeah, no, big, big fan of thing. And I think Canadian whiskey has a real opportunity. Yeah, it, was, it's misunderstood. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say something quite similar in that. In that, do you think that there's opportunity for craft distilleries out of Canada? You know they're obviously a, a driven. They, that industry is driven by your Canadian clubs and your Crown Royals and and that kind of thing. But that might open the the floodgates a bit for smaller distilleries to really get their foot in the door for like a larger, more international. I, I, I think so. Mm. I, re- I really think so. Um, I mean, you, you look at again. We're going to use and I, we, when we're talking about Shelter Point, and I'm sorry, Patrick, if you ever see this, we should be talking more about Shelter Point. Mm. But from an Australian market's point of view, people think Canadian whiskey, they think Canadian club. Exactly, yeah. And even Canadian club is misunderstood. People think that's a rye. You know, yeah, right. Canadian rye whiskey, that's mm. the only whiskey they make. Well, no, it's actually closer to a bourbon. It's mm. got more corn in it, but the biggest difference for them is instead of doing like a mash bill of 60% corn, 30% rye, 10% mm. barley and distilling it all together, they'll often distill separately, mature separately and then blend back together for flavour profiles right, right, okay. at 8, 10, 20 years, whatever that is. But, <coughs> excuse me, there's not a huge amount of knowledge around even Canadian club. Yeah. So how does that translate to to what this is? And I actually think it's it's quite an interesting move by Shelter Point because this is an unmalted, essentially a single grain. Yep. It's using barley, but it's unmalted, so you can't call it a single malt. But they do do single malt and they do do single casks of rye and single casks of barley and they do releases with barley and rye mixed together and it's not always disclosed on the label mm. i think which in in two ways is quite interesting the fact that they've gone this is our release this is what it is you're either going to drink it and like it or yeah. you're not you're not going to judge us because we're a single malt or a yeah, bourbon style yeah. but then the other way for me i would like to know exactly you know I, I can tell you the, the latitude and longitude exactly yeah. where this was grown. Yeah. But just reading the label, I can't tell you what exactly it was that was grown. It's an interesting contrast of transparency uh, transparency between that. Because it's kind of like, that's what I was thinking. And obviously you talking about this, to me, it kind of seems like, right, these guys, you know, they want to tell you as much information about, you know, their grains and where it comes from. But then kind of you don't get those key points that consumers, you know, often go begging for. Yeah, and I think, yeah, potentially that misses a trick. I, I don't know the Canadian market as well as obviously mm. they do, but this bottle has the word whiskey written on it somewhere. Okay, that's a very good point. This is a no, I'm, yeah. The word whiskey is written there on the Shelter Point logo, and it is written there on the other side on the Shelter Point logo. Shelter Point Distillery, Monfort District Lot 141 from Filter Flask, August 2017, Product of Canada doesn't actually have the word whiskey 
written on it, which yeah. I think is, I don't know, is that a, we don't want to put ourselves, like, if we export, we don't want to be lumbered with bourbon. We don't want to be stuck with scotch. We want to be our own thing. Yeah. It's a really, like, that. it's it's a quite a, I understand the thought process behind that. And again, we are very highly speculating on, on what's going on here um, and the thought process behind it. But, um, you know, I think that's, would it would be helpful to, to know that information. Yeah. You know, it could even just be like a, you know, going against, I guess, um, stigmas of certain products and not wanting to be, yeah, like you said, not wanting to be lumped in with other stuff that isn't necessarily similar to what they're trying to do. Yeah. 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 I've just actually been forwarded a bit of a fact sheet on this oh, yeah. whiskey by, by someone here who's listening. Um, so I might row back on, on something like we know it's two row barley. Um, we know it's, it's unmalted. It's saying here double distilled um, rather than triple distilled. Okay. Now I know for a fact that if not this release and the next release might be triple distilled. Right, right. So um, this is again maybe part of the confusion if between the Montfort label different batches are being treated differently. Yeah. I think that might be where a bit of the confusion can, can come in sometimes. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's a really, I mean, we're going down a rabbit hole of trying to analyze this label and, and mm. figure this out. But at the end of the day, the whiskey is excellent. Yeah, I, I really yeah, think it is. It is. And really tasty. They're, they're so close to getting to the point of being such a great distillery instead of transparency mm. and, and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, obviously, like, there's another issue. If I Google mm. and go to their official website, I guarantee this vintage that we're drinking now is outdated that will have a new vintage yeah, of whatever yeah. the next one is um, on their website um, but really really tasty and you know it is super tasty. my um my penchant for whiskey in general whether it's a scotch a bourbon a japanese a south african or mm. whatever i love to taste the grain in it yeah and there's one thing you can definitely taste in this whiskey and not in yeah. a harsh way it's like it's not i remember it being greener to be quite honest with you when we first opened this a couple of months ago um but right now, I think this is really well balanced grain on the nose. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it, going back to something you said, does this open up the opportunities for someone else? I think it still needs to be led from the top. You look yeah, at someone like okay. Johnny Walker these hmm. days. You have all their colours, and they all their colours sold well, and blah blah blah. And now you've got special releases and mm. 17 different types of Johnny Walker blue label and finished in this cask using this distillery green label and all sorts of different things if when Canadian Club and Crown Royal and that sort of thing start to play around with that I yeah. think you know we are we are the one percent of the one percent of Canadian whiskey drinkers are drinking shorter point less yeah, than the one percent 99.9 percent are drinking those big ones so it need to come from the top down mm. Canadian Club finished in a podcast Canadian Club 200th anniversary of whatever yeah, yeah. you can find that happened yeah. 200 years ago type thing <laughs> in a special gold decanter bottle and chuck 50 bucks on it um, and I guarantee there are some people sitting, some accountants and executives sitting in offices coming up with those ideas I think that will also be quite a big um, changer of the perception of Canadian whiskey as a whole and it'll almost premium, you know, make it a premium thought process Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can buy a very expensive bourbon yeah. You can buy very expensive Scotch whiskey, you can buy very expensive Japanese whiskey. He went out and said, I've got five grand to blow. Yeah. I know this bloke who likes Canadian whiskey. It's Christmas, I want to buy him a five thousand dollar Canadian whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Where do you, like, yeah. Where do you, like e that. even if you want out seeking all the shit that we hate mm. about gold stoppers and stupidly yeah, heavy yeah. crystal decanters <laughs> and all that sort of stuff, I don't know where you'd go to find that, particularly in Australia. So um, yeah, that is, be, that's an interesting point, actually. Do they do any petered expressions, says Crafty Field? Yes, they do. I don't believe we've seen any in Australia yet in terms of any bulk. Um, uh, there might have been one or two bottles sneak through, but yes, they definitely do. Um, but again, it's one of those things where, and we, we always thank the importers and the distributors who bring us all these lovely bottles to come in uh, to the country so we can sit around here and talk rubbish and, and drink them. But special releases like petered spirit and that sort of mm. stuff, get sold to the, to the Canadians and then the Americans and poor Scotty Farrow has got to go in with a cricket bat mm. and uh, up against a, a, a swathe of baseball bats yeah. and try and get a, a six pack or 12 pack 
for all of Australia. So um, it's it's very very hard thing to do, but we're very thankful that it does happen because there is no way I'd try this this other way, otherwise rather. Yeah, no, this is delicious. I'm really impressed by this. Yeah, and it's one of those things you need to get it in people's mouths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like you said, like the the, the label just doesn't give away enough to really just look at a shelf and go, yeah, that one. Yeah. It's almost a great tease, the label. Yeah. You've got longitude and latitude, which yeah. pretty much no one else in the world has. <laughs> and then you've got, yeah, not a lot else, but I actually quite like the levels. I mean, I'm still not sold on the glass toppers. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, I, I don't need a cork. Yeah. If you can give me a fake cork or a screw cap. Um, but, you know, there are some people that actually think that looks excellent. Yeah. What are your like, thoughts? In terms of the how the, the look, pure aesthetics. I, I do like it because I do like how the it it seems like the you never s- escape the glass. If that makes sense. Like it's quite seamless between stopper and and body. Which, yeah. To me is is like it's like an elegant thing. Now it's maybe not like the most purest traditional approach to to a whiskey bottle, but you do see it just does look like almost just like like a decanter almost. That you would just you would seal up, pop in, pop out. Yeah, yeah, I, I can I can see that point of view. Yeah, I also like that old school thing of obviously you, you get a cork or a screw cap and then you get the shrink wrap over the top. Yeah, yeah. Love ripping the shrink wrap mm. off so you reveal the neck and it looks like an old school bottle. Yeah, yeah. But you can tell someone's just put a cork. Put in the that's cork an old in school, yeah. you know. Yeah. Out in a bar somewhere, you know, in the nineteen forties, and someone's got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In type <laughs> Schooner thing. glass full of whiskey. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, or whatever it was that was in that bottle. Yeah. <laughs> But no, it's looking, it's looking great. Yeah. So um, French and English, one right? Which is cool. Yes, yes. Um, and kosher, kosher as well. Yeah, right. Which you don't see on too many whiskies, um, which I noticed before um, when I was reading out the longitude and latitude. Um, yeah, kosher whiskey for all those playing at home. Um, yeah, cool. One of the, yeah, I think we have, we got one bottle of this left. It's it's done. It's stuffed and it's sold. The reason I did this one is not to particularly move a whole bunch of bottles because I've only got one left to sell mm. um, but there are a couple of other <laughs> crafty needs a glass label yeah take that yeah. one on mate yeah Ho- holographics oh, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of wines come through with the eight labels actually etched into the glass yes, I, it? happy birthday dad yeah <laughs> um, there are there are a couple of others that we have in store at the moment we've got the car strength which is a, a mixed grain uh, and then the single malt as well but very 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 tasty stuff and not I think this is going to be one of the things they're winning a lot of the awards um, at the the various whiskey awards around the world in Canadian single grain categories. It's not a single malt; it's unmalted barley, mm-hmm. Canadian single grain. This, and to be quite honest, there's not a huge amount no, of competition of people that are entering into <laughs> those categories, particularly in like the under under twelve ages and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. But I think we're not far off that shelf, and whether it's this release or something else they come up with, we'll, we'll jag a you know. A, top three in, mm. in something um, and it'll just go through the roof yeah and um, yeah. you know you look at Daft Mill in Scotland I sort of referenced that a little bit the hype is incredible yeah, similar right. sort of thing farmer that makes whiskey every now and again grows all their own barley those bottles we see maybe I think we saw six of them mm. this year from the, the second release double the price sold out in a couple of days yeah, type right. thing God knows when we're going to see any more this is pretty much the exact same thing but coming from a very different, yeah, basically yeah. the other side of the world. Um, but yeah, it's also coastal. You see, you do get a little bit of that coastal element in some of their mm. single malts. I found a little bit more. I don't know if it's something about um, malted barley that holds onto mm. those those um, you don't get those chemical compounds. No, not on this one. I, but yeah, um, if yeah, so if you haven't tried a, a shelter point before, I would I'd definitely keep an eye out for one. There's um, this sits around the one. 170 mark off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, the single malt's uh, very, very much in the in the affordable window at about 120 yeah. a bottle, and it's it's in a few places. So definitely go check it out. As with always, this will be sitting here for the next week until we finish it. Um, so if you find yourself near the oak barrel, come and say good day, and we'll, yeah, pour a pour a bottle and, and have a chat. But um, yeah, it's probably no, no, it almost definitely is an entire another podcast, but. Just to just to open the open the floodgates a little bit, but um, awards and reviews, because I know yeah, they're everywhere. You know they're in spirits, wine, beer, all, all those sorts of things. And you know we see it from a 
a retail perspective how those things sort of affect our products and, and, and how that works. Um, but it's, I just can't really see the, the golden formula of, you know, how to work those reviews and those awards. I mean, like anyone and everyone will tell you that if they saw the price of Yamazaki 10 years ago, they would have bought, spent their house on it. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, is that award just going to send it through the roof like it does for so many other things if, if it comes one day or is a, a point score going to, you know, start paying people's bills or... I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. And it's, whether it's right or wrong, um, and there's so many awards out there for everything at, at the moment. Um, you know, for, for spirits, you'd enter your spirits into like a, say it's a whiskey, you can enter into four or five whiskey awards around the country, that's around the world, and then also do all those different spirits awards around the world mm. and all that sort of thing. There's a couple that I pay credence to. I think the World Whiskies Awards, I think they do a really good job. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the one I look to the most in terms of as a consumer going, right, okay, this is something I probably need to try. Yeah, um, and source it out, and if it be not necessarily just the one that won, but all the other things that rated quite highly there. Um, other awards, as a retailer, when you see things get announced, you yeah. go, "Oh God, there goes my week." Yeah, the yeah. phone's going to be running yeah. hot. Do you have this bizarre, obscure whiskey that only got released in one market in America and never even made it to Australia? Can I buy a pallet of it? No, yeah. of course not. <laughs> um, you do frame. I've, I've honestly, I don't go chasing them. Mm -hmm. If they fall into your lap, obviously you pick them up and put them on the shelf, but you don't go chase them because you can spend hours and hours yeah, and days yeah. and days yeah. chasing stuff you're never going to find. Um, they're, they're interesting. And like, there are some that I think are run really well, some that are run not so well. Um, I'm obviously a, a, a judge of the Australian Gin Awards, mm -hmm. which is something I'll be honest, was quite hesitant to get into and spent a lot of time on the phone with Bill Lark, who's the chairman of that judging panel initially to talk through how it's going to be run. And eventually it came down to, um, I'm not being asked to be on the panel because I'm Scott Fitzsimons. Hmm. I'm being asked to be on the panel because I'm the person who does the spirits at the Oak Barrel. Right. So be very careful yeah. about dragging the Oak Barrel name into anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then also thought, okay, I better give it a go before we um, before I start knocking things. And so I'm glad that I, that I have done a couple of those now because you sort of get into it, you see what works, you see what doesn't work, and then I can sort of be a little bit more discerning on which other awards in the method in which they judge things about that so it's really a case by case mm. element um, I mean you know to put okay for example the uh, like from the Oak Barrel Bottle Store Awards mm. you have the two things we get nominated for the Alias which is a, a national awards then there's also the whiskey one two weeks before that we got an email from a company in um, in the UK oh, saying yeah, yeah. We, we've won a I forget the name of it you're the best bottle store in Sydney thanks to the something awards couldn't tell you what it was I was like I've never heard about this I don't yeah. know what they are went on the website tried to figure out like go through this minefield of whatever it was couldn't figure out anything about why we'd won this award there was no nominations I think it's basically one of those magazines you pick up at you know the airport lounges yeah, yeah, yeah. it tells you best things to go yeah. to here but as I was going through I searched the oak barrel um, and it came up with some bar in Chicago called, you know, Barrel House or something like that. Yeah. That last year had won Best Urban Wine Bar of Chicago. Yeah, right. And so I quickly figured out there's like 2,000 winners in this awards each year. Yeah, yeah. There's like Best Independent Bottle Store in Sydney, Best Independent Bottle Store in Western Sydney, yeah. Best Independent Bottle Store in Surrey Hills by this company in the UK that must do nothing else yeah. but sit there and just find these stores and yeah, we'll just give it to them this year. Yeah. They might buy an ad to them. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, we don't, probably don't need to worry too much about yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, don't get too caught up in that. Um, so I think that in a, in a general term of no matter what the award's mm. about, um, you have to be quite careful with. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously for, for distillers and um, and producers and distributors, it's a different way that they would approach those things. Mm. But as a, as a consumer and probably more importantly for the sake of what we're talking about tonight, as a retailer, I'm very, very careful before I get up and start waving and yeah, sending yeah, emails about, yeah. do you know yeah. this one best whatever? Yeah. Because, yeah, we need to be legitimate about everything we do here and I can't always be that with awards. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Squash grapes time? Squash grapes time. Did you have any final thoughts on this? I really enjoyed it. Like I did, I like. I really like it just, it, to me it was just like, like it's just pretty, really elegant. Um, 
lovely and expressive, uh, but not you know not too too crazy as uh, you know some single grains that I've, I've tried especially can can really get the spices going pretty pretty hectically. Um, no, I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, I guess for, for my final thoughts would be something that you said straight off the bat was mm. the prettiness mm. of it, that lavender, that floral notes, which I hadn't seen from it in previous examples. Um, yeah. I was expecting, I was a little bit nervous when you said, oh, maybe I'll do the red second, mm. like, this mm -hmm. could be pretty jarring, yeah. this first whiskey coming off the bat. But I'm glad we did it this way around because it's really shown some expressive florals. Yeah. Right. Let's squash some grapes. <laughs> Um, and yeah, feel free to ask any questions uh, at the point tonight if, you, if you're tuning in. I know I can see there's a few of you who are. Um, we, we like questions. Um, and if there's anything as well that you would like us to talk about in the next couple of weeks, I think we, we mentioned it last week. When we hit the new year, we'll start getting some guests in and doing some real mm. drill down theme topics and sort of put some nights together. Um, but towards the end of the year, it's just a bit chaotic and people are running around. So we'll do a pretty pretty loose and free form which to be fair is probably our strong points keeping yeah. it loose and free form <laughs> um, as uh, you know we sort of run into the uh, the festive period yeah I mean we'll, we'll probably be going right through Christmas with this with this sort of thing anyway so see here Christmas Christmas Wednesday do a 12 hour long podcast yeah, on Christmas day could do that yeah, yeah we'll do it <laughs> um, but no it's yeah, yeah the um, I picked a I picked a red tonight that I was um you know, with this sort of thing, I like to always take an opportunity to like go out and open something cool or like you know a little bit that I may might not hadn't tasted a while or something I thought was quite unique and out there and interesting or has a good story behind it. Um, and this this certainly does. But it's also just one of those wines to me that is really quite comforting. Um, like it always been a safe bet if I ever need to like t take wines to dinner and I still want to drink a wine that I really like and I really enjoy, but you know still have it please the table of people um, but on paper it, it reads really interestingly so this is um, from a little village called Goals in uh, southern Austria um, so the producer is Klaus Pressinger he's uh, started off quite young first finished in 2000 he would have been just older than 20 years old when he was doing that um, and I think for regions like like Goals and, and a lot of like Austrian regions and, and German regions especially that maybe 20 or 30 years ago weren't the most progressive in terms of um, boutique wine or you know smaller more hands-on farming and it was much more commercial in a sense um, he sort of came from from that background of working with larger like higher production wineries that didn't care too much for the vineyards or the soil or anything like that and was in and out of there pretty quickly um, making wines in a, in a larger more commercial fashion so he now has um, a bunch of sites um, scattered across across goals working with lots of um, native varietals in Austria so this is a blend of St. Lorenz, Weigelt and Blaufrankisch in there okay I'm going <laughs> to put that up on the uh, thing but give me yeah. about half an hour to spell that yeah, yeah. so um, yeah he is um, very much a a natural organic biodynamic farmer that makes wine uh, with varietals that make sense in this in his climate um, which is if these three reds also works with some Weissburgunder some Pinot Blanc some Grüner Lina as well um, what I really really like about Klaus's wines is just going back to that that respect for the soil and the vineyard first and foremost and then letting the grapes kind of be what they are with careful uh, attention to farming and then growing up into to these sites so um, yeah really really fun little little red blend this is 2016 he has released the 17 that's in Australia now as well but I really like how the wine kind of develops in bottle um, over the, the three years that it's been in bottle now for and uh, yeah just just one of my one of my favorite favorite producers in Europe at the moment I'm Austria to me is a really really exciting place compared to what it was you know 20, 30 years ago with the, the commercial winemaking now with guys like Klaus um, and like Carl and Eva Schnabel um, and a bunch of other guys. Uh, Klaus is actually the youngest and one of the founding members of a group called the Pinobile, which is like a um, biodynamic association for uh, an association for biodynamic farming and winemaking in um, the sort of Bergenland region. 
Uh, so there's him and about five other guys when they started, and now it's been to 30 growers and that they that they're working with. Um, and I think they have their own certification, Penobal certification for wines being produced in this region of Austria to a certain standard. Yeah, but right. he was only about 21 when they founded that, so very much a, a young gun of the of the area. Um, Nick Nick Lauder um, chips in, loves Austrian wine. Ah, yeah, g'day, Nick. Um, it's 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 quite interesting because it has its bolted on fans. Yeah, and you were talking about some regions just then that were traditionally quite traditionally quite traditional, mm -hmm. historically mm -hmm. quite traditional is what I should probably say. Or commercial. Commercial, yeah. Um, it's like Austrian wine as a whole, like you mentioned, you know, Zweigelt and mm -hmm. all these sorts of really, um, you know, native grape varietals. Has that stopped Austrian wines from going a little bit further out because they're not Burgundy, they're not Pinot Noir, they're not these names that people from other countries can hold on to? Or? I think... That to an extent, but I, I, also, I think more than that, it's been the, the nature of, of the winemaking. It's like, it reminds me a lot of like Georgia, where we see now in the store just how, like how much of a, you know, bolted on or, or cult following Georgian wines have and how you're only getting certain amounts and people are, you know, snapping up quick, quick, quick. But I don't think the Georgians never wanted that. They never expected it or they would never think to be shipping pallets of Georgian wine to Sydney. You know, it was always made for the family, made for, you know, the neighbours and that kind of thing. And I think Austria has a, has a bit of that as well, where it's not as if, like, they might be aware that, that these these varieties are a bit more challenging or a bit less known, but they don't care. And especially when you're talking in quantities like, like Klaus is making, like Carl's making, um, they're, like, it's like the, you know, allocations that you were just talking about before where... Um, you know, if if the our Australian import doesn't take it, the American import as well. So there's no there's no need to be going out and trying to make as much as much wine as you as you possibly can. It's exactly what Klaus does. And um, next you mentioned Christian Sheeter, who makes some incredible incredible wines as well. Um, very very good Cabernet Franc and um, some Riesling as well. But it's one of those ones where it's it's the, these are the vineyards and they attended to so passionately following organic and biodynamic practices that it, like in if you're going to get a small crop this year you're going to get a small crop there are preventative me measures you can take in the vineyard to bump up crop um, that doesn't necessarily fit the ideology or the, the standard for organic and biodynamics but they they don't do that because that is adding something artificial into the vineyard which shouldn't be there in the first place um, so yeah I think you see a lot of that out of these guys and also um, Germany as well. German reds, I'm super excited about. So, I'm um, seeing some some really really good uh, German reds come out at the moment. But that's been even more difficult because I know, if going back that 20 or 30 years, you were looking at massively massively overcropped vineyards trying to produce just big or trying to produce racy acidic rieslings, um, and you know these big clunky table wine reds that were you know you had added tannin and, and added acid to bring these wines that maybe weren't necessarily the best suited for the, that area up to where people thought it should be. Um, so it's really, really exciting to see um, Klaus and, and um, Christian and um, Carl and heaps and heaps of other guys that are really challenging the, the concepts of what Austrian wine was to what it probably should be now. And I, I see that in all of his wines. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, big g'day to Big Bad bus Bustling Barry, um, who's in the Hunter Valley uh, this week. Love the Austrian Rieslings too. Haven't tried any reds yet. Um, have been in the Tyrrells Vineyards today. Love oh, really? Week. Say g'day to Bruce for yeah, us. Say g'day to Bruce. Probably don't remember us, but um, <laughs> that's right. He's a good bloke. Yeah, Austrian Riesling and Austrian uh, Grüner Veltliner as well as, I guess, probably the most famous wine the Austrian producers, Grüner Veltliner, um, which we've got a bit of in Australia now, but it's very much one of those things that is is you have to be so careful with the, the site selection for these sorts of varieties. And that's why I think these wines work really well for Klaus because he is meticulous in, in how he grows and where he grows. And if it doesn't suit, it doesn't work. Yeah. So before I start talking about what I'm getting out of this wine, I just want to row back a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, can you repeat the varietals in this? So it's uh, predominantly Blaufrankisch, yep. some Saint Laurent, and some Zweigelt. And is that quite a traditional blend, or is that something a little bit out there for 
Well, it, it would be, yeah, yes. It would be a traditional blend, not necessarily because those are the varieties that you grew and that you then went out and sourced and blended together very carefully, but especially going back in the day, is that's what was on the vineyard. Okay. And that's what you picked and that's the thing. So, you know, you do see more commercial expressions of, especially Zweigelt and Blaufrankisch, which can be quite big and quite rough and quite tannic, really high, like really heavily extracted, long time on skins. And, you know, you do get that, that earthy kind of really unpleasant chalky tannin note towards it. Um, whereas when you're looking at this, this is 11 and a half percent ABV, which is, which is low for those sorts of varietals, but they picked earlier, retain the fresh and the, the freshness, the acidity and the fruit forwardness, and then, um, just blend it in, in careful amounts. But this would also be based on that concept of just taking what the vineyard is giving you yeah. and blending it together. Yeah. Yeah, and I've jotted down a few other questions that I have you about here. Mm. Um, Yvette tunes in from uh, Victoria, Country Victoria, says, You were right, Scott. Jerry really does know his stuff. I'm impressed. I'm just reading off a script in front yeah. of me here. But... You, can't, you can't see the auto cue, <laughs> yeah. Yvette. It's, it's why I didn't know anything about the shelter point. It was down. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was gone. Um, I've got a few more questions about mm. Austrian wine in general, but mm. I want to talk about this particularly, what I got from it, was that, yes, fruit forward, had that almost that what I consider that almost that little bits of spritz, but over that little bit of acid just yeah. on the front palate there, but earth that really yeah. earthy note to it, and that's sort of why I want to bring it back when you were talking about Blau Frankish. Then, what's giving you that? Is that the grape variety, or is that the vineyard, or yeah? So, so I guess you would put it down mainly to the varietal, which is Blau Frankish, and you especially see it in Zweigelt as well, um, which do have really lovely bursting fruit aromatics and fruit flavors, but they do tend to have that that rustic kind of burnt soil thing that goes through them. Um, but one of the other interesting things about all the Plausel's vineyards is they're very low topsoil um, going basically straight down into a large plateau of calcareous uh, limestone. Um, I'll be back in one second. <laughs> and then, um, so so his, his vines are made to struggle, which is, you, you do hear a lot of people talk about vines struggling, and especially in the, the organic and minimal intervention farming and, and wine world um, people want want their vines to struggle that's why you can't you're not allowed to irrigate your, your vines in burgundy yeah because they they need to like they need to survive on their own which is which is what this does as well and what it does especially in um, maybe not as wet vintages um, limestone does do a very good job of holding on to water density but they will they will fight for, for that for that water retention so they will dig deeper they'll dig deeper and try and get that so I think 16 wasn't it was actually quite good for them but um, I do remember people saying that um, especially non irrigated or dry farmed vines were, were, were pushing down a little bit further and that can bring out those uh, more muscular notes in, in uh, varieties like Blau Frankish yeah <coughs> but I think it's tempered well here yeah um, yeah. I think well, Zweigelt's a bit of a softer grape, isn't it? it yeah, yeah, so Zweigelt, uh, for anyone playing along at home, is probably very close to Pinot. Yeah. I would describe it. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's got, yeah, it's Pinot with a little bit more, I don't know, like Pinot Gamay kind of thing going on. It's still got that juicy vibrantness, but yeah, um, yeah Blaufrank kind of reminds me a little bit of like Aussie Grenache. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the okay. yeah, 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 100%. Yeah. yeah, I can see where you're going there. Hmm. Um, Hmm. I've, I've just had a thought actually because it, my uh, good friend Yvette did tune in just before I want to bring in a new um, uh, what's what you do when you like got a game show and there's a new and now for this seg segment there's a new a new segment yeah a new yeah. segment of this yeah. one so top of your head so hmm. I know Yvette um, whenever she's in Sydney is looking for uh, red wine likes a drier Italian style hmm. um, with a, quite a long finish this is probably not it's true. I think she would like this but straight off the bat. Yeah. G'day, Joey. I'm um, just looking for a bit of a uh, dry Italian style of red. Where do you where do you push me straight away? To a uh, dry uh, Italian uh, style. <laughs> 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 but like, give, give me a grape variety or give me a, a region or like it doesn't have to be Italian, yeah. but something in that in that world. Uh, I think, I mean, I suppose one of the the funner things about us working here and walking in here is you, you can maybe get push towards something that's a little bit, you know, maybe not, not, not to the um, standard ring of the bell. But if you're looking for dry Italian style reds, I'd probably be looking at those same varieties, but in 
draw areas of Australia. So you look at um, things like Barbera coming out of the Hunter, or you're looking at you know Sangiovese coming out of McLaren Vale, uh, or even like Florio Peninsula yep. down there yep. uh, would be really fun. Um, I'd probably actually go uh, so sort of um, Eastern Loire Valley Cabernet Franc, something like Chinon or Borgiel, um, because that has that really lovely dry kind of herbaceous spice towards it as well, which I really, really like, or some uh, Champigny. Uh, or you could go for um, uh, Eastern Bordeaux Malbec, yep. which I which I, I quite like as well out in, out in Cahors. If you do get a, like a draw, like a, a, a Cahors Malbec with a bit of age on it, that's that's really cool too. Because that, I mean, it's different to Argentinian Malbec in a sense. Um, Chilean Paes, I think you could yep. you could look we, at we as well. One of them, yeah. I I, I like this. Smile. I reckon we should. I, yeah. like, I threw in the deep end there. Yeah, yeah. I reckon maybe at right at the end each time we do a live stream moving forward, I throw one to you, you mm-hmm. throw one to me, mm-hmm. and we just try and find something. I like this. Recommend me something else, yeah. and we'll do that. Yeah, so I could have a lot of fun. If you, we've got a little bit of time left to go on this one. So if you've got any mm-hmm. ideas of you like something and then would like to think of something else, spirits or wine, uh, throw it to us and we can have that. Um, I just, if I didn't say that, then I was going to forget about it. Because yeah. so, <laughs> all I wrote down was... That's cool, because now I've got all, all these ideas. You yeah, know, yeah, some, we can get on to... Some old Rioja, some... Um, got Cahors from... Uh, some good Cahors yeah. from... Yeah. Um, dragging the live stream back onto yeah. its rails. <laughs> um, in terms of... Oh, so you're obviously mm-hmm. in... The new world, we talk about grape varietals mm-hmm. from regions. When we talk about the old world, particularly France and Italy, and that's when we talk about regions and that sort of thing. Where does Austria sit in terms of its sort of uh, classifications? In that sense, I'd yeah. say old world. Okay. Definitely. It's- so in, in this, this just says mm-hmm. um, Klaus Pressinger. Yeah. It's got another word, which I'm not going to try and pronounce. Kalkin Kiesel. Kalkin Kiesel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, red 2016. Yep. For a punter mm-hmm. walking in, I mean, it says dry red wine. It doesn't give you the grape varietals on the back there, as far mm. as I can tell. No, no. What like what am I looking for in an Austrian red wine to, to find out what I should be drinking? So, I think it's it's going back. It's, it's kind of like when you talk about the old world varieties, you talk about um, obviously region more so than anything. And I think we, we don't have the exposure to Austrian wine that we do for Italian and, and French. So, um, especially here, no one's going to know what. Well, very few people would walk in and go, "Oh yeah, Goals is pretty good for Blau Frankish in 2016, isn't it?" But like, when, when, if, when a customer walks in and, uh, and says that, <laughs> that's when Scotty's face goes, "Oh, I'm out of my depth here." Yeah, Joey, Joey. But um, you know, people will walk in and, and like, for the most part. Um, uh, Doran says Shelter Point equals Starwood. Um, probably not. Probably not. Um, we can get onto it's that in a softer. Yeah, it different flavour profiles, mm. similar ethos, but different flavour profiles. But sorry, mm. Joey, going back to you. Mm. I was gonna say, but like, you know, people will come in and they'll know that Barolo equals Nebbiolo, or they'll come in and they'll know that uh, Burgundy equals Pinot Noir, that kind of thing. So I think I, and it's it's tough because you know, people, like especially Australian consumers want to know what's going to be in that bottle, right? That's just, that's the nature of, of us is it's like, that doesn't mean anything. Tell me what's in it. But I do actually quite like the fact that it's okay. just the name of a, um, it's actually a, a, a Klaus makes two wines. He makes Kalkund and he makes Kiesel. So this is kind of just the, the idea of blending those. Um, but I think it's kind of one of those, one of those tricky things where you know, I say I like it because I kind of just I know I'm getting I know I'm getting dry Austrian red wine made hopefully like more than likely the way the winemaker wanted like wanted it to be you see a very similar thing in, in Alsace uh, right on the border of Germany there yep, yep. in northern France so they obviously do lots of um, lots of Riesling lots of Pinot Gris lots of Gewürztraminer a little bit of Pinot Noir a little bit of Pinot Blanc as well and you do see um, Expressions that are come out and they're labelled Riesling or they're labelled Pinot Blanc or they're labelled Pinot Gris, but like are then going back a while and you're still seeing a lot of very famous producers doing it, where the the, the wine is labelled the vineyard, and it'll say Le Clos or, or or something like that or, or Hoffenheim, and and I know people that have had conversations with these winemakers and gone, oh okay, but what's in it? You know, Hoffenheim. And it's like yeah, yeah but whatever we grow there, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's the the ideology of being like, 
Why would you ask me that? It's it's the vineyard. Um, and I really like that. I think that, I actually think that's quite cool. Um, confusing, but very cool. Yeah. It's unexpected because we were a little bit rushed uh, tonight in terms of picking mm. things, but a bottle of whiskey and a bottle of wine yeah. <laughs> that actually true. are very, very intriguing yeah. and really drag you in on the label and go, okay, I want to know, and they give you like a hint mm. and you okay, I want to know everything about this wine and I want to know everything about this whiskey. And I go, well, what am I going to tell you? Yeah. There's nothing on this label that can tell you exactly what's in it. And I also like um, what... I do really like about about Klaus and them. It's purely an aesthetic thing, but you do see a lot of these, you know, natural winemakers in different countries making some like amazing, amazing wines, and their labels just get pretty wild pretty quickly. Like we've seen some pretty crazy labels come through the shop here, and that's always it's always good if like as a general rule of thumb that the wackier the label, probably the more natural the wine is. But Klaus just he just refuses to budge. Uh, it's just, it's like a really simple, you wouldn't be able to see it on there. Plain white, really well, really light. Normally we say on the live stream, the exposure is, you know, clouded everything. Yeah. That's the this label. Is, this it's is just white. It's just a white label, really faint gray signature and his name at the bottom of it. And I, I, I don't see that changing. Uh, he does have Pusta Libre, which comes in like a longer sort of large Coca-Cola style bottle. Uh, which is a little bit cheaper than his other expressions, which is uh, St. Lorenz Weigel Blend, which is just fun, super carbonic. Put puts but, a Libre is Austrian for party. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, um, oh, sorry, pizza and party. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I just I just love it. Like, he's not making these minimal invention, really enjoyable, easy drinking wines because it's some marketing thing to make a bunch of money off. And that's exactly how he... It tended to be. That's what the vineyards gave him, and that's how it turned out. So I think he's a really, really talented winemaker. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, g'day to Aaron, who's joined in as well. And we sort of touched on it, Doran, um, just in your question there regarding shelter point. Um, does that equal Starwood? Um, no, L largely not. Um, mm. There's a lot of similarities in terms of ethos and transparency and that sort of thing. But Starwood is an urban distillery mm. in Port Melbourne. They get their barley from all sorts of places. Shelter Point is a farm distillery. It is distilled from the grains that you can stand at the distillery and look around and, and see the farm. So I would say Shelter Point, in terms of Australian uh, comparisons, is closer to a Belgrove. Yeah, Because yeah, Bel Belgrove yeah. these days is using a lot of barley mm -hmm. spirit as well as uh, rye that um, is grown. Um, in Scotland, it's Darth Mill. Um, you know, on Isla, it's Kilhoman. and mm -hmm. it's, it's those sort of places. Um, so it's closer to, to that sort of thing. Um, just when you were about half an hour ago and you first started talking about this wine, mm -hmm. you said that this was a bit of a, a winner for something to bring to house parties or to dinner yeah. and that sort of thing. And obviously you know a little bit about wine and you know what you like and your flavours, uh, your flavour profile, given that you know and like a little bit of wine, might be a little bit more extreme, you know, than what other people who are, you know, like a glass mm, of wine, mm, but yeah. couldn't tell you the difference between a Bordeaux and a Burgundy type thing. Um, what is it about this one that attracts you as a bit of a crowd pleaser? Well, yeah, so, I, yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm mentioning that I was, um, you know, it's obviously coming into this sort of season, there's always lots of events and parties and, you know, dinners and, and all the rest. Feel and, free to invite us to any of them. Because yeah, we really don't have any Yeah, Tuesday night we're sitting here. <laughs> but, um, you know, obviously liking this, the styles of wine that I like to drink, which, you know, can get quite eclectic at, at times. And I've, you know, rocked up to one too many a, a dinner or a house party and completely missed the boat <laughs> on where I thought I should be. Because that, that magnum of pet nat doesn't really sit well with grandma and granddad. Um, so this, this wine for me is one that, like, I know I can sit down and completely enjoy. And, you know, I feel good about the, the farming and... Um, how Klaus makes his wines, but it's not funky. It's not weird. It's it's like it's it's really lively and energetic, but there's no faults or anything that's really going to throw you off. Or even non faulty natural wines can sometimes have that nose, which is a little bit like discerning. Um, so what I really like about it is just it's quite rounded. Um, it sort of sits in that very much medium bodied category, and you know spicy. It's there's like enough talking points without blowing anybody away. Um, but the wine guys that want to get real geeky about it can do, but also people can just sit and, and really enjoy it. Mm. I think um, the, the Puzza Libre, mm. which you mentioned before, is sort of one of his 
I guess you'd say, not necessarily an entry level, but a mm. wine made for quick and yeah. um, it's a, early it's consumption. Like it's, a, it's a real light red that's uh, full carbon and can you serve it out of the fridge. Yeah, and I'd like that has been a go-to for me for mm. house parties and you know nights where it's pizza and movie nights and yeah. that sort of thing. This has those same elements to it, but you're watching Citizen Kane yeah. instead yeah, yeah. of you know, Mean <laughs> Girls type thing. Yeah. And like the best part is you can take it to um, to a dinner or a house pair like that and um, no one actually knows what's in it so you can just start making things up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Best thing about it, Austrian bridles. <laughs> yeah. It's just, oh yeah, it's pretty pretty heavy and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, should, should the point cow sell? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, roughly what does this go for a bottle? Uh, I think it's about 50 bucks. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it, it's a premium wine but it's yeah. not... Um, it's it's a it's a festive period special special occasion yeah. sort of wine, but it's not going to break the bank. I mean, I'm 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 quite impressed that his wines do come into Australia at that price point. To to be perfectly honest, like I do think that there's probably a little bit of room for it to go up. Hopefully, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, he does have that entry level sort of post de libre, super fun, but still very class passenger like. And then you jump to here, and then he actually does do some single site Gruna Veltliner and Pinot Noir. Yep. Um, which sit at around the 100 mark. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so on that point in terms of importing as well, we have Scotty Farrow at Wonderland Drinks, mm-hmm. very, very small but um, passionate importer based out of Melbourne to thank for Shelter Point. Mm-hmm. Who do we have to thank for um, the Klaus Pressinger? Uh, so this is Tom and James at Lo-Fi um, Wine. So importers that we work very closely with and two very, very passionate individuals. Um, basically responsible for bringing in some of my favorite wines that we see in Australia. So Christian Cheetah, um, those guys bring in, um, Klaus Bressinger, they've got uh, Michael Gindel, who is also based, based in Austria, a little bit further out, but he follows closed circuit biodynamics as a as a practice, which is another talking point altogether. Um, they're just diving into- I need, I need to get home at some point tonight, mate. Yeah, yeah. I can't start that topic. Uh, Fabio Gea um, in Northern Italy, and um, Alessandro Viola down in Sicily as well, making some really, like like just a, a, a monster, like a really really good portfolio. Um, and yeah, something I'd love to just see see more of um, coming in. Then we hopefully we just fill the shelves with <laughs> ethically farmed farmed wines and and really delicious. But one day, yeah, yeah. And I think um, one of the things I said uh, at a tasting uh, uh, last week, I think it was as well, actually. In that, um, I remember in high school, I know I was an English student rather than a maths student. Mm-hmm. So I did better at English than I did at maths. And um, there was a, there was always this um, poster in the maths room, and it was a picture of Albert Einstein with a quote, and it said, "I promise you, I oh, so no, if you're having troubles with maths, I promise you, my troubles are bigger than yours." <laughs> and I sort of like, yeah, probably Einstein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I hope so. And then I was getting into uh, whiskey and. Um, uh, you know things for the first time you know 10 years ago properly and importing things and you know getting hit with the tax bills when it came and that was annoying then i started working at the oak barrel and i was like geez their tax bills are a little bit more than mine yeah, yeah. and then you deal with importers and you go Oof, i know my tax bills are probably yeah their tax bills are bigger than mine i think the same goes for wine yeah. with wet and everything else that comes along with it so a big thank you to to all the importers that um that uh, bring all the great booze six seven thousand different products in the store at the moment something yeah. like that um at a, at, a, at a conservative sort of guess so there's a lot of importers and a lot of people who who make all of this happen yeah i do think that there is um there's a there's a there's a, a really special talent to have in the world to be standing in some cow paddock in austria <laughs> tasting wine out of you know cardboard cups and going yeah this is pretty good. Yes, I, I can plug this. I can sell that. I can sell this and show it. And like, and then to see it here and, and have it here and just go, yeah, wow. So yeah, between, I mean, yeah, the Lo-Fi boys are um, doing a really, really good job. And Campbell Burton, I've also mentioned in previous podcasts. Yep. Um, does another outstanding, outstanding job bringing in. Char- Charlie from last week. Charlie, yeah. Yep. Um, and if you listen to this, we will get you all on here next year. Yeah. I promise. <laughs> so you can actually talk we're gonna properly. Get, we're going to get bored of talking to each other soon. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I think to be fair, the listener, the viewer, is going to get bored of us talking to each other before yeah. we will. Um, I did throw you under the bus halfway through it. The new segment mm-hmm. I came up with halfway through the idea of I like X Y Z. Can you recommend me something there? So do you have something to like fair's fair throw to me? 
something what I reckon we'll do at the end of each yeah. podcast moving forward. I would say. Uh, okay. Don't have to. I, no, no, I'm no, happy no. to go home scot free. Like yeah. I'm happy to <laughs> get off the hook here. Like without labeling the obvious ones, where do you go to get into Australian whiskey? Okay, where do you go to get into Australian yeah. whiskey? How how does old mate that's been drinking McAllen's and Glenfiddich's? How do, how do you how do you buy a bottle for him of Australian whiskey? That makes him go, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so Australian whiskey has quite a big price point mm-hmm. um, yeah. matter to it, but taking price point out of it, um, pushing that away, uh, the first place I would go is to somewhere not Tasmanian. Mm. I would go mainland and go inland. All right, okay. So I would look at someone like a Blackgate. Yeah. I would look at someone like a, um, a potentially maybe, even though it's not inland, a lime burners mm-hmm. and go, this is a spirit distilled in Australia and matured in some very extreme climates. Right. So if you want to, and people always ask, you know, what is the, what is the Australian taste for styles? Like, well, we make whiskey all over Australia and North mm-hmm. Queensland is very different to Tasmania it's very different to country New South Wales it's very different to Albany and all these sorts of places but in somewhere like and for me obviously I'm a New South Wales boy um, out in Mandurin out near Dubbo it gets to 35 40 degrees during the day you go to sleep at night and when you wake up you have to hit the pipes to have a shower because they've all frozen over yeah. overnight and those extremes particularly through summer cook these whiskies and they they mature Mature is not the word, but but they take so much yeah. oak influence. They extract so much from the oak so quickly. That for me is whether it's in a port cask, a sherry cask, a wine cask, a rum cask, whatever it is. That is the Australian story of Australian mm. whiskey. In that our climate is so harsh, and you're going to get a lot of things happening very soon. So if you get someone coming over and say, "What is an Australian whiskey? How do mm. I get into it?" You give them something extreme like that, and go, "Do you like that?" Okay, now we right, can go down. Right, right, okay. So, so you're not necessarily going for that soft, easy approach? You no, just... because I think Australian whiskies are the extreme. Yeah, yeah. You Even like you're, you know, you go to a two-fold or something like that, that's a blend that carries so much flavour through red wine barrels, mm. um, you know, about 60% wheat spirit, 40% malt spirit, um, matured in, in Port Melbourne, in, in South Melbourne there. Mm. And even though it's not as extreme as country New South Wales, yeah. still takes a lot of flavour from those red wine barrels from South Australia very quickly. Mm. And in three years, it's done. It's ready to go. And so I think that story is probably better told through the eyes of the extreme coming right, back down. Right, yeah. um, you know, you can look at Tassie, look at the other rooms, your big port, mm. sherry barrels. Um, you know, Sullivan's Cove, I think, is even though it's excellent and, and the, the juice is so, so good, it's a bit of an outlier. Mm-hmm. You can't go in to Australian whiskey through Sullivan's Cove and go, this is what it's all going to taste like. Right. Because it doesn't. It takes, you know, 10 to 13 years to mature. Um, and if you left a Starwood for 13 years, A, there's going to be no juice left. It's all yeah, evaporated. Yeah. And it's going to taste pretty pretty rough and um, tannicky. So get into Australian whiskey. Go for the extreme. Yeah, right, right. Go, go, go for the uh, you, you can go over the top. Mm. You know, you can get something too tannic, but go to a producer where you know it's going to release quality. Something like a Blackgate. Um, if you were looking at Tassie, maybe something like a, um, a Spring Bay. Mm-hmm. Um, Iniquity, yeah. I think as well. You know, they manage, you know, their whiskies, you know, I think it's very little over five years old. And I've tried a few of them and, you know, they're not good over five years old. Yeah, you, want, yeah. you want to keep them yeah. young because they've taken too much on. So, um, yeah, to answer that, in, Iniquity, um, Blackgate, uh, and probably probably a Spring Bay in the... Yeah. In the bourbon or port cast okay. game, Tassie. Yeah. This I like this I like this game. Yeah. Well, let's, let's do this more. <laughs> um, well, ladies and gentlemen, we've run over time by about ten minutes, but that is all right. Um, we didn't have any technical failures today. No, that's a head start. I mean, <laughs> How good are we? Yeah, well, I mean, we could be sitting here talking to ourselves. Yeah, that's true. Could have been knocked up half an hour ago. We don't actually know. Um, but yes, the bottle of wine will be finished tonight. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, uh, well, for, for you, not for us. Um, the shelter point, there's a little bit left. We'll be doing a fair bit of sampling of this. But if you swing by the Oak Barrel, 152 Elizabeth Street, just in the museum station, any time the next week before we finish it, more than welcome to, to have a drink of that. Um, yeah, also, obviously, well over capacity, but uh, hopefully we'll be seeing a few of you at our members' party tomorrow night. Yes. Uh, which is always always a good night. Yes. Know, so. And we've got, um, we didn't get a chance to actually announce what we've got coming up tomorrow, but 
Um, if you are coming to the members party tomorrow night, in terms of spirits, I have two Australian distilleries on show. Um, one is brand new that you probably have never heard of before, um, unless you're quite switched in from Marrickville, which is going to be pretty cool. Doing a vodka and an apple pie. So it does it, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. Starts with a Moby, ends with an us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and some canned spritz and some gin. Yeah, some spritzer. I'm, I'm assuming Kathleen's going to get dressed up as the uh, Christmas elf again. <laughs> so it could, it could be wild. What do you, what do you got? Uh, so I will be on my own table, um, uh, just opening a bunch of bottles from our newest um, French import shipment. So we delved pretty heavily into the Rhone Valley, uh, which is where I see like some some stunning stunning value coming out of. So there'll be some Cote de Rhone's open. There'll be some Croix Hermitage. There'll be some Saint Joseph. Maybe some Jagonis as well, um, and then of course, party juice, uh, which is going to be our, our newest champagne that we uh, that we're bringing to the country as well, Gouet Henri. Um, so yeah, going to be talking all things French, um, and then our good friends from Saint Wine will be on the other table um, showing us some Rosden. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so obviously super well established Barossa producer. And just before we go, speaking of party juice and mm. parties in general. Saturday, our last That's event right, for yeah. the year. The sort of the big, the big, uh, the big send out for the Oak Brow Tasting Room for uh, 2019 is going to be Illuminate. The poor carpet. Yeah. The poor carpet. <laughs> and which is which is uh, it's pretty it's pretty big this year, I think. So, I've got um, we've got you know close to 20 distributors and producers coming in. Um, you say look, big, I say dangerous. Yeah. Lots of lots of like super super cool grower champagnes are going to be open. Um, so not just like the big uh, names and stuff like that, but seriously well put together grower champagne and then some stunning little Aussie juice as well. Yeah. Should be great. Illuminate our biggest sparkling wine yeah. festival party of the year this Saturday. Um, are there any tickets left? Uh, like five. Five. Yeah. <laughs> That's not that's 500, probably, that's not 50, yeah, that, is, yeah. that, is, that is. I can count them on my hand. Yeah, okay. yeah. But no, it'll, it'll be fun, so. Awesome. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you, everyone who, who joined in tonight. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, we will see you next week. I don't know what time next week, but hopefully Monday, potentially. I think we might try to do a Monday again. Monday, yeah. we'll, we'll try and do a Monday again. Um, but we are going to have a little bit of fun. Hope to see you, if not tomorrow night, if you're in the area, on Saturday. Um, if not, and before we I'll, I'll drop the lid of my pen there, before we leave, as always, we spoke a lot about farming and grains and grapes and everything coming from the earth. And I think it's one of those things you see in the in the media that they need to rotate their news cycles a little bit. But we should not forget the fact yeah. that more than ever, half the state, um, and not just New South Wales anymore, is on fire. No, yeah. If you if you are in Sydney, you would have felt it today. Uh, probably the smokiest of all the days in the past yeah, two or three weeks. Time. Been been pretty full on. So I hope everyone out there is doing doing pretty well, um, and and staying safe wherever you are. And hopefully nothing that you own or anywhere near you is on fire. Um, and also not to forget that while this current emergency is going on, that we are still well in parts of the droughts. And even if all the fires went out tomorrow, we still need some bloody rain yeah. uh, to help farmers grow some things and 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 keep afloat because it's pretty pretty dire out there at the moment yeah yeah it doesn't happen without those guys yeah so keep doing those rain dances as we are doing before christmas um and have a safe one uh, until next week if we don't see you beforehand thank you very much and i'm gonna it's a double click i know it's a double click to turn it off go. this time i'm nailing it. i'm getting every week i'm getting better